Good day, good evening, and good night, people. It's Cameron Van Hoy. Great to see you all again. Thanks for joining me. Let's talk about movies. Oh, boy. How do we make our movies? Um, I want to talk about financing movies because that, for many people, it's like there's a lot of people out there who want to make film, and they, you know, they feel like they got the goods. They've got the talent. They don't need to be told what to do. They don't need to learn the creative process. They've read all the books. They understand the nuance. They've worked, whatever, right? They're ready. You're ready. You're ready to make your movie. But how? How do you do it, right? Because movies, and this is what makes them so great, but also so tough, right? Is that they're expensive. Movies are really freaking expensive to make. So how do you do it? How do you make a movie when it's just making movies just costs tons and tons of money? Well, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. The first is you could just scrounge whatever money you can get and make something that's kind of micro budget, right? Unless you're like a multi, multi millionaire and you're scrounging together whatever you can get to go make your film, which that's a thing, by the way. And I will talk about that in a second, you know, but unless you're a multi millionaire, you're, you're, you know, you're going to pull together whatever you can get. What is that going to be? A hundred dollars. maybe, you know, and even then I think for someone to pull a hundred thousand dollars together, you got to be pretty well off to be able to spare that money unless they're just going all in, which is risky. Okay. Movies are risky. They are risky investments when you look at them from an investment perspective. So be careful. Don't go all in if you really can't afford to lose it potentially, right? And especially if you got kids or something, think about that. You know, if you're on your own and you're just, you, you feel passionate, you've got to do this, you want to put everything you got on red, go for it. That I'm all for, right? If, if no one's depending upon you and you want to take that risk, that's how things happen in life. You've got to take the risk. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to bet on yourself because no one else is going to do it if you don't start doing it to begin with, right? And if you want to make big movies, you want studios, agents, actors, all kinds of creative people and bigger financiers to bet on you. Well, you better be able to bet on yourself first, right? And that is why it's important to have a short film or even a feature film under your belt to really get to that next step. And how do you do that? You got to bet on yourself. Now, millionaires, if you're a millionaire, you know, a millionaire who wants to make movies and, you know, is going to put in all their money. There goes my phone. Who's going to put in all this money to make their movies for themselves. Listen, I've seen that before. I've come across wealthy people who are like, I'm an artist. You know, that's that's really who I am deep down. And I want to make a film and I want to, you know, it's like, it's almost like the investment dude or, or, or a woman who doesn't, care about the art. They're like, Hey, I'll put money in, but I want to make money back. I'm doing this as an investment, right? Like you almost like that person more, even though it's tough, right? Cause how do you explain the investment, which we'll get into? Um, but yeah, you almost like that person more because God, the, the wealthy person who thinks that they know how to make a movie better than you and is going to take control or wants to be in it or wants to have all the say, like, It's very hard. It's very hard because it's a skill. Filmmaking is a skill that you acquire by practicing, by doing, by making movies, by studying film, trial and error, making things, putting them in front of audiences, seeing how the audience responds, studying the greats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Surrounding yourself with filmmakers, film culture, and you learn how to do it by, 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 by investing your time into it. So, you know, lots of times wealthy people will just come in and be like, I'm going to make my movie. I know what I'm doing. I am an art, whatever, you know, the ego gets involved. Ego can be a killer. Ego can be such a killer. And sometimes when people are in it for the wrong reasons, there's tons of ego and very rarely does that succeed. Okay. Very rarely. Now, of course, there are always the exceptions, tons of exceptions. There are tons of great movies that have been made that are really successful that were literally made by really wealthy people who are like, I want to make a movie, whether they wanted to direct it or just produce it is different. Oftentimes, if you're kind of study the history books, usually they're just producing um, and kind of supporting a really good vision and getting involved. And there's incredible amounts of stories of people that are finding success in that way. So it's not impossible, but these are just some of the pitfalls, right? So outside of the wealthy people who want to make movies, you want to make a movie and you're not like uber wealthy or wherever you are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you can make a movie with anything. You can make a movie 
on your phone. And there are people who do it. There are people who make films on their phones and have started great careers for themselves. Okay. So remember, anything's possible. There's no get rid of the blockage, get rid of the barriers. There's no preconceived notions about how it has to be done. There's no rules. Okay. The only rule is the movie's got to be good. So you can scrounge some money together and do it yourself, right? Or you can maybe go to your friends and family and try to raise some money from other people. Say, hey, I want to make my film. This is what I want to do. And don't expect any money back, right? Don't expect any money back. Whether you're scrounging it or going to other people, there's the don't expect any money back. If money comes back, great. You're going to get some money back. But if not, you're allowing me to make my first film, which is something I've always wanted to do or whatever it is, you know, whatever the pitch is. And maybe you can do something that way, right? An extension of that is like a Kickstarter, crowd, crowdsource, crowdfunding type situation, right? Where you're saying, hey, you're not going to, I'll give you a t-shirt. You know, I'll give you a DVD when it's done, whatever it is, but don't expect anything back, you know, which is, hey, it's a very valuable way. Now, let's say you want to do something a little bigger. Well, what are the options there? Well, one, again, is you can go to wealthy equity investors, right? And you can say, hey, invest in this movie. Now, why would someone want to invest in a movie on the equity side? Well, because potentially they're going to make money. So, you know, how, what are some comps? Have you studied the marketplace? Do you know what films were done with private equity and why they made money and how much money they made and how they made and how many succeed and how many fail and what kind of the parameters are for that, right? So you kind of maybe want to study the market a little bit and you can present and say, here's the deal. Now, there are ways to sell films, many ways to sell films. The trick is, is that it's a very tight knit, very closed, very complicated world. Okay. There's tons of output deals, whether it's even still DVD, Redbox, uh, the streaming services, international sales, et cetera, et cetera. Walmart's like, there's still tons of places to get films out there and sold tons of companies that will buy, but you know, getting to the right acquisitions person and being able to even contact them in the first place, then navigating what the contract should look like and then making sure that your deal is the right way because there's lots of tricks and pitfalls that exist within that landscape. You need some kind of understanding. You need, unless you're getting paid the cost of your movie and some upfront, no questions asked, I get paid, you get the movie, which those deals are hard to come by these days. Um, it can be tricky. So you really want to be nuanced in that if you're going to go out to private equity. Now, here's another way that movies get made all the time, foreign pre-sales, okay? By the way, not even foreign, any type of free sale. It could be domestic pre-sales, okay? Now, this is a whole class of film that's made by getting a movie star or someone with a name, someone who has some foreign value, right? Because there are actors. And listen, people go to see movies because of actors. That really used to be the case. It still is the case to a large degree, very large degree. I think it's changed a bit over the last few years where people are going to see movies less and less because of actors uh, and more and more because of its genre or its story or the characters that exist within the film. A couple of case in points and why this is quickly. One is you look at like the Marvel universe, right? That you could argue that people are going to see their favorite Marvel film because of their favorite Marvel character, not necessarily the actor that's playing. I don't Fully agree with that. Obviously, like look at Robert Downey Jr. What would Iron Man be without Robert Downey Jr.? And that can be said for a lot of these characters. These actors certainly do elevate uh, certain characters, but still we have seen IP kind of take over where back in the day, it was really a movie star driven thing. You know, you were seeing Die Hard because of Bruce Willis. You're seeing Rambo because of Stallone, et cetera, et cetera. You're seeing the Eraser because of Schwarzenegger and so on and so on. So, you know, the era of the movie star has waned a bit for sure. And I think a lot of that has to do with social media. You know, people are so connected to their favorite celebrities now via social media. You don't have to go to the movies to see them anymore. Back in the day, if you wanted to see that larger than life person, you had to go to the movies to see that person. Really. It was very hard to be connected. But now we have all these people that have taken the role of the celebrity, the role of the movie star, I don't even make movies you know, more than half of them now, they're just, you know, what do you, what do you call them? Influencers or whatever. And they've filled this weird need that we have to like communally, socially as a group, kind of like look up to our stars are the, you know, the, the royalty within culture, the influencers, the ones 
who we aspire to be and, and dream of and, and live vicariously through. Uh, and we, we get, we get that and they don't have to be in movies. They don't have to do anything. A lot of them, you know, they're just, they're, they're just famous for the sake of being famous, whole other topic, but I do think it's hurt the value and the position of the movie star overall. I mean, if you, you know, like look at who, who are the great young movie stars compared to like what a movie star was back in the day, it's just changed. The sal- it's proven even in the salaries, the salaries has changed. There's nobody young making the type of dough that Tom Cruise made in his prime or Schwarzenegger made in his prime or Willis made in his prime or any of Brad Pitt made in his prime or yeah, any of these actors who were movie stars in their prime were making. And that's just because the game's changed. The market has changed. And that's okay. Things change. You got to roll with the punches. That's fine. Um, so pre-sales, there are still actors who you can get pre-sales off of. And the numbers many times are smaller. And a lot of these movies are kind of done in this like two to $20 million range, you know, 20 kind of being the higher range. There's, there's higher still, you know, but that's the two to 20 is probably like the the solid range where most of these are made. And and that's just an example of like, you get Nicolas Cage to be in your movie. You agree to pay him whatever it is, you know, a few mil to be in the film. And then you can make the movie for another couple of mil. And then you can sell the movie for a few mil more than what he cost and what you made the rest of the movie for. And you're making a profit. Right. And so there's a lot of people that understand this. They have the ability to sell these films. They have the ability to get Nick Cage attached to their project and they come together and they make the movie and they pre-sell it. So they're not really even risking anything. What they're doing is they're going, okay, cool. They go to the buyers around the world or wherever they go. I got a Nick Cage movie. What's that worth? They kind of roughly know. And, you know, the buyers kind of, oh, we'll pay this much for that movie, especially if it's within this kind of genre. Genre is important. Right. Um, genre being, you know, is it an action film, a comedy, a horror? Of course, you know, comedy doesn't really translate that well overseas because it's very nuanced to the culture and the language. Whereas action, everyone can enjoy action. I mean, physical comedy is different, but no one really does great physical comedy anymore. Physical comedy, in theory, should translate. Um, of course, drama is being like the hardest to sell internationally because uh, look, you want most people want an escape when they go to the movies not this kind of cathartic dark night of the soul, which I love. And I think we all need every once in a while, but there's just probably less of those needed in the market than action, horror, thrillers, suspense, et cetera. Um, So genre is important and then talent key. And once they get that talent attached, there's no risk anymore, really, because they're, they know what they, they've pre-sold it. They're like, okay, it costs this much to make it. We've sold it for that much. There's a little bit of profit in there. Now all we have to do is deliver the movie to get paid. So they'll lend the money they'll, or they'll go to a lender and say, hey, we've got the guarantees here. All we have to do is give them the movie. It's got to go make the movie. We're going to make money. There's money here. You can make a little money if you lend. Okay, cool. I'll lend. But how do I know that you're not going to go over budget or not run away with the money or not mess this movie up? Well, that's where the bond comes in. Just like you know, real estate. If you want to build a building, you go to the bank, say, I got a piece of land. I got little uh, plans here. I got the whole construction team ready to go. We're ready. All we need is the money to do it. The bank goes, okay, cool. We will finance it with debt, but we want a completion bond. And there are companies out there, bonding companies that will bond these productions. And they'll say, all right, we'll guarantee this movie's getting finished. So if everything falls apart, the weather comes in, a storm, a flood, director die, whatever happens. We're going to come in. We will make sure that it gets finished at that budget so we can deliver it to the buyers and the money is taken care of back to the lender, right? At minimum, that's going to happen. So then you deal with the bonding company, very little risk. Not the greatest movies come out of this system for the most part. There are gems every once in a while. That's probably true for any uh, you know type of movie being made in the industry today in any different way. But this is a very this is a very sound way to make a film, okay? Now, what's the other way to make a film? Well, you can go to one of the studios or larger production companies and have them finance it. Uh, you, you know, there's, there are studios still out there and there's these mini studios. There's all kinds of production companies, A24, Neon. There's a variety of places that you can go and say, hey, I've got a movie. Do you want to make it? Now, again, these companies are not going to be as cut and dry as the foreign presale thing. 
they are assuming a little bit more risk. They're taking a little bit of a different bet. Um, many times they're relying more on the domestic market than they are just the foreign markets. So they're able to make a different type of film, a film that serves a more nuanced consumer. You know, some of these foreign films many times can be this like type of action and just kind of, they're not really pushing the boundaries by any extent. And a more sophisticated viewer might want something a little, a little bit more than that. And so there's a lot of these companies feeling that. And then of course the, the bigger scale action stuff, if you're going to the larger studios to do, something you know like uh which they don't really do that much anymore but like original action kind of ip or something along those lines right um you can go to them you can go to the studios you can go to production companies and see if they'll do it very hard it's very hard you know but they still exist as a way to do it and then of course there's like new interesting opportunities to finance films that's popped up um there is which has been around for a little while now kickstarter crowdfunding where you can go out and say, this is what I want to do. Support me. And we have seen some success stories with this in a variety of different ways. Um, most recently, I forget the name of the project, but it was like a religious faith-based project. And this one gentleman's putting together, raised a ton of money across churches and religious groups to go make this story. We've seen Zach Braff and other really cool filmmakers turn to Kickstarter to make their stories and their films and find some good success. And they're able to make these movies and, and raise uh, funding that way. And then the newest way, which is still growing, very new, but super interesting, is utilizing kind of blockchain Web3 technology. There's a whole ecosystem growing out there with digital tokens, NFTs, uh, crypto, and all of this stuff. People are utilizing these communities, these technologies to raise capital, whether it's like a crowdsource scenario or more of like a pool shared um, revenue split thing, which can be complicated with SEC rules, but you know, the, those, those structures do exist or there's like a plethora of things, which we'll, we will get into in other videos that's occurring in that space that actually provides value back to the consumer who might be partaking or buying these NFTs in or cryptos in the hopes of the film getting made or the film getting made and then can participate to some degree or have some ancillary uh, value that's created from holding. And there, you know, there have been a few filmmakers now that have been able to put together financing to go make their first film or their second film uh, utilizing this. And so you should keep your eye on that if you're interested to make films and, and are trying to find ways to put together a budget. But I hope that helped. Those are some of the ways that films are made nowadays. Um, but yay, listen, if I missed anything, let me know. Let me know in the comments below. And uh, I hope you have a great day.